This is my favourite example of the power of genetic modification. So in the front, you'll see a genetically engineered mouse and in the back is a normal mouse and they're running, they're hungry, they're running for food, they're running at 20 metres a minute and they keep running until they get exhausted and can't run any longer. So after 200 metres, the normal mouse is exhausted, can't get on the treadmill even though it's very, very hungry. The genetically engineered mouse, super mouse, goes not for 200 metres, it goes for five kilometres, it goes for several hours. Now what cause this change in the ability of this mouse to run at this level. A small change in the glucose metabolism of the mouse. Um, and we share the same kind of sugar cycle, the same sort of uh, metabolic cycle as, as the mouse. You, you could create super men and women today through this kind of genetic engineering. It's not scientifically difficult. The reason why there aren't super mice and super men and women are twofold. One is the mutation, this Pepsi, K mutation just never naturally occurred. Or if it did occur, it was too expensive to run because you've got to eat twice as much. You've got to find twice as much food to fuel this kind of metabolism. But we could make these changes in one generation. Okay, so could you do this to moral behaviour? There's reasons to believe in principle you could. Um, advances in the understanding of human moral psychology as well as advances in the un understanding and availability of human enhancement technologies. What do we know about human moral behaviour and its limitations? This is an expanding field that we're working on in Oxford. We have a number of projects to try to understand the neuroscience and psychology of ordinary human behaviour. For example, we have one project looking at why do people make small sacrifices for large benefits for other people? This, I believe, is a fundamental aspect of any morality, an easy rescue. Yet, I'm not sure about Sweden, I can't remember your organ donation rates, but in many parts of the world, the organ donation rates are appallingly low, even though this is a case of w where you could save seven or eight lives at zero cost to yourself because you're dead. Um, so, you know, this is the, I think organ donation is a testimony to human moral limitation. Um, the presence of an eye uh, makes people behave more generously. Three dots shaped like a face makes people behave more generously. If you reverse the shape of the dots, it doesn't have that effect. Closes your eyes, closing your eyes polarises moral judgement and makes people more, mono, more honest. Laughter has the opposite effect, making people more morally permissive or indifferent. It also makes people more utilitarian, being willing to sacrifice one to save five others. Sleep deprivation, recent study of US soldiers who didn't sleep for 50 hours showed that it increased the willingness of people to sacrifice one to save more, decreases emotional intelligence, and caffeine had no effect. So what these examples show is that lots of features of our environment shape our moral decisions apart from rational deliberation. My favourite example comes from Israel where they studied the actual parole decisions of judges and what they found that the likelihood of being, and this was a very robust statistically significant finding, the likelihood of being offered parole dropped the further your case was from the last time the judge had a meal. And there's a, great, there's a science around self-control. Um, and what that suggests is it's, it's, not, it's not just glucose. Um, there was a glucose hypothesis that it was glucose, that which you might think, oh, they, they're getting low blood sugar. Of course, there's very robust mechanisms for maintaining blood sugar. It's actually the, just the presence of glucose and not an artificial sweetener in the mouth that increases self-control. So these sorts of features about ourselves as animals I find fascinating and they have direct implications for our ability and the manner in which we solve moral problems. Another example you may be familiar with, the so-called warrior gene. The monoamine oxidase A mutation, A gene comes in two polymorphisms, the high activity variant, two thirds of you have that, and the low activity variant, one third of you will have that. Now if you have the low activity variant, and you're abused or deprived as a child, you're much more likely to have impulse control disorders, commit violent crime, end up in jail. Now, the fact that you're sitting here 
Uh, and of course, these are statistical associations. It's not that perhaps some of you do have the low variant and were abused as children, and yet you're able to, to sit here and not, not attack me for saying these inflammatory things. Um, but statistically, there are significant effects of this gene over behaviour. And you could test for this by testing embryos now. Psychopathy is another strongly, uh, there's great, very sophisticated science, neuroscience and biology around understanding psychology and being able to predict it. Um, and indeed, in, in children with the childhood version of this callous, unemotional personality, it shows about an 80% heritability. There are even genes that dispose to greater altruistic behaviour. And you would expect this. Humans, what the basic rule about human beings is they're not all the same. There's a distribution. If you take any characteristic like violence or altruism or psychopathy, there's a distribution. Psychopathy is just the bottom 1%. It blends into a normal character tray called psychoticism or hard-headedness, the ability to make hard decisions, sacrifice people for long-term goods. That's much more common. Serotonin. Many of you will be familiar with this uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, higher levels of serotonin are associated with increased levels of cooperation and reduced aggressiveness. So antidepressants, so-called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, increase serotonin in the brain. They increase cooperation. They reduce criticism of others. They result in a fairer distribution of resources. They reduce rejection of unfair offers and people are less likely to sacrifice one to save a greater number. Now, I'm not saying here that serotonin is a moral molecule or that increasing serotonin makes people more moral because these are complex effects. What it does show is that, you know, how you behave morally is going to be affected by not only the circumstances around you, not only by your history, but also the drugs that you're on. Um, another drug that some of you will be on will be oxytocin. It's contained in the, or released by, the oral contraceptive pill. It increases trust, it increases trustworthiness, it increases cooperation, uh, but all of this is within your own group. It's a bonding molecule. It's released by sex and breastfeeding. It aims, its purpose is to bond you more strongly uh, to those close to you. It reduces those effects on our groups. And indeed, in one study we found in Oxford, I was mentioning this over lunch, Sylvia Turbeck, uh, one of our PhD students, found that propranolol, um, an ordinary uh, antidepressant, reduces so-called implicit bias. This is a uh, bias that's picked up by psychological tests such as the implicit association test. Magnetic stimulation, can also influence morally relevant behaviour. In one study, stimulating the right temporoparietal junction made people less inclined to judge unsuccessful attempts to harm as being wrong. In an example of immoral enhancement, researchers used electrical stimulation to make people better liars. Uh, the possibility today of massive radical genetic manipulation is already with us. So there are mice with better memory. There's the Methu Methuselah mouse, um, which lives twice as long as a normal mouse. There's voles, small rodents in the United States who are monogamous rather than polygamous because of genetic engineering. Um, there's massive cows and mice with muscles the size of Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's monkeys that work harder and so on. Now, th this just shows in principle that biology is, is uh, capable of being manipulated